Welcome everyone to uh, this event on the US presidential transition I called the United States after uh, Trump. Um, I'm really pleased to, uh, to have you all here. Uh, my name is Matthew Hayes. I'm the Canada Research Chair in Global and International Studies at uh, St. Thomas University. And this event is organized uh, with uh, Sean Ryan from the Department of Political Science and also with the help of Tracy Glynn uh, from St. Thomas University. Um, uh, we, most of us who are participating tonight are on unceded Wollastiquoi territory. And in addition to acknowledging the, the uh, traditional um, uh, ties that the Wollastiquoi uh, people have with this land, uh, we'd like to reflect also on the unequal ways in which this territory has been used and how it um, has also uh, produced unequal um, uh, access to spaces and discussions uh, like this one. Um, I'm going to uh, pass the, the baton right on. I want to thank everyone for coming. Uh, Sean Narine is moderating tonight, and Sean, I will pass it on to you to introduce tonight's speakers. Thanks, Matthew. I'm Sean Narine. I'm a professor of international relations here at St. Thomas University. Uh, I'm going to be the moderator, as Matthew just said. I'm just going to quickly read off the biographies of our guest tonight, and then I'll give you a little bit of instruction on how we're going to conduct the the question and answer, and then we can begin. So first, uh, our first speaker is going to be Jamie Gillies. Uh, Jamie is an associate professor of communications and public policy in the Department of Journalism and Communications at St. Thomas. He's a political scientist by training. His academic work is focused on political communications and public policy, in particular, American presidents and Anglo-American executive, executive leadership, um, the US White House advisors and personalization of political leadership. He's the editor of the recent book, Political Marketing into the 2016 US Presidential Election. And he's also the executive director of the Frank McKenna Center for Communications and Public Policy. Our, our second speaker is going to be Brad Cross. And Brad is an associate professor in the Department of History at St. Thomas University. He's an award-winning teacher and his research interests include social and environmental history of multinational mining companies, corporate social responsibility, and comparative urban history. And then lastly, uh, Abby Chomsky who is uh, a professor of history and the coordinator of Latin American, Latino and Caribbean studies at Salem State University in, in Massachusetts. Dr. Chomsky has collaborated with scholar activists in Atlantic Canada on research and solidarity with Colombian workers and communities affected by coal mining. She's the author of several books, including Central Americans Forgotten History, Central America's Forgotten History, sorry, Revolution, Violence, and the Roots of Migration, Undocumented, How Immigration Became Illegal, A History of the Cuban Revolution, and They Take Our Jobs, and 20 Other Myths About Immigration. So I think this should be a very interesting talk today. Now, I've asked um, each of the um, speakers to keep their comments to between 12 and 15 minutes. And just very quickly, um, the way we're going to conduct the question and answer session is you can all see the chat function that, that Zoom has. If you want to ask a question, please send me. This is Sean. Well, you, can, you can see my name right there, so it's not a problem. Uh, so send me a uh, note on chat and let me know you want to ask a question, and then I will call your name in the order in which I receive the questions. If you, for some reason, don't want to actually ask the question yourself, but want me to ask it for you, then just indicate that, and I will happily read the questions out. Okay, so without any further ado, I'll, I'll turn the floor over to Jamie Gillies. Jamie. Thank you so much, Sean, and thank you, Tracy and Matthew, for organizing this and putting this panel together. I think it's really important to have uh, these different voices to talk about what happened in the U.S. election, the aftermath, um, the subsequent insurrection, uh, inauguration, and now that we're in a post-Trump era, at least until 2024, with the Biden presidency. So what I would like to do just to start us off is talk a little bit about the campaign and what I saw happen uh, and maybe do a little bit of a summary of where we're at and then talk about what I see as eight challenges that the United States faces over the next little while and hopefully set that up for Professors Cross and Chomsky. So um, Joe Biden won and I think there's probably a lot of people on this uh, this Zoom chat today that and, uh, and panel today, who are very pleased that that happened in the sense that uh, Donald Trump is no longer president, the Trump administration is no longer in power. Um, so it's good, but it's not great. 
because Joe Biden faces an America that has not been this polarized and divided likely since the Civil War, that there are challenges that I don't think the Biden administration cannot, can possibly deal with. Um, despite the decent rhetoric on, on some things uh, that likely will not even be addressed in the next four years. Uh, so it's good, but not great. The other concern I have is that progressive voices in the United States are likely going to be drowned out over the next four years. Uh, and this has to do with the character of the Democratic Party and how they won the presidency and held the Senate and the House, where the, the, the progressive side um, likely will not get um, the same uh, focus that moderate Democrats will have. And you, I think you're already seeing that happen. But I just want to put this election maybe before I get into some of these themes in perspective. Um, if 44,000 votes had gone the other way in Georgia, Arizona, and Wisconsin, Donald Trump would still be president. And despite the fact that uh, that uh, Joe Biden won the presidency with a popular vote margin of at least 6 million, um, this was a fairly close election. And if it hadn't been for democratic activists uh, and strategists in a variety of states understanding that the uh, Republican party and the base was as fired up as the democratic base, this could have been another nightmare scenario like 2016. It was just through the, the grace of hard work and understanding the dynamics in a pandemic that the Democrats were able to just hold the presidency. So the upside is yes, Trump is gone. The downside is, is you're facing uh, a incredibly recalcitrant uh, Republican Congress um, who will not do the right thing on a lot of issues despite these attempts to talk about unity and talk about bipartisanship, that likely won't happen. The bigger downside for this, and I'm not even speaking politically, is what's happened to political discourse in the United States and the radicalization of voters, particularly on the far right, but not even the far right, just the right, uh, just those who supported Donald Trump. Um, you know, open racism, xenophobia, conspiracy theories being part of campaigns now. And the Republican Party not doing an, a forensic audit after losing an election like this and trying to determine how best to maybe get back to what was the normal. Uh, they do not seem to be doing that at all. And so that's pretty indicative of what is going to happen in the Biden years. There is going to be no collaboration across parties. Uh, and... I'm not sure you're going to get many votes even for conviction of the president in a few weeks. So uh, that's sort of the, the campaign. Now, as for where the United States might be going, I, I see eight challenges and I'll just lead with the, the most pressing, which is obviously getting the pandemic under control. Um, why does the United States have the most deaths, uh, the highest percentage of they're, they're the country besides a very few countries in Western Europe uh, with the highest percentages of those who have COVID. Well, you can argue that it's poor government planning or that people aren't paying attention, but it also has to do with the fact that the vast majority of the country have just lost faith in institutions and don't trust government at all, Republican and Democrat, but in particular, the way in which politicians use uh, and exploit that trust or that lack of trust. And we saw this in 2020 in not having a coordinated national response to the pandemic. And that is the reason that Joe Biden has to face the possibility of half a million deaths by the end of February and uh, trying to contain the virus will suck all of his political capital and oxygen for the next six to 10 months. Um, so that has to be the number one thing that the United States has to deal with. The second is probably reversing Trump era policies. And that started from day one with executive orders. But that's just getting back to maybe where the United States was in 2016. This is not progressive legislation. This is not changing uh, rules around immigration. It's not changing uh, uh, and bettering and making uh, equality and equity issues central. 
These are simply, I think, a lot of platitudes and a lot of attempts to reverse damage, but no major movement on things that have been sitting uh, that the Democratic Party or the base of the Democratic Party has been wanting to pass. So once those executive orders are done, um, it's not like they have bulletproof majorities in the House and Senate to pass much of anything. So there might be this brief honeymoon period where Joe Biden gets to say a lot of things, but I'm not sure that the actions will follow. Uh, the third is uh, Democrats now have to focus on holding the Senate and the House. Uh, the lack of bipartisanship means that the only way they can get anything done, including passing probably a budget, uh, uh, is simply to hold the Senate and the House in 2022, and very few incumbent presidents are in a position to do that uh, in American history. That's just historically has not happened. So Biden has to watch that, which means that he has to enact much of his agenda within the next 12 to 16 months. Uh, fourth, you're dealing with a decentralized media um, outside of the, the major networks and a few papers of record, and a right-wing media that's not fact-checked, has no journalistic standards, and social media that runs amok with conspiracy theories. And we're not talking a minority or a small minority of people who believe these views. This is half the country now, half the United States. And you're not reaching them on MSNBC or the Washington Post opinion page, uh, not necessarily reaching them in a form like this uh, and, and, or changing anybody's minds. And so that is going to be a massive challenge for Democrats and Republicans who think they're talking to everybody when they're talking to half the country. Fifth, normalization of political violence. Uh, my colleague on this panel warned me uh, days after the 2016 election that uh, things would be similar to what they were before with a lot more hate crimes. And that exploded in the United States and then uh, came to the, the came to fruition with the insurrection on January 6th. Um, this president is likely to be acquitted. And what lessons do Americans and, and American politicians learn from that? The political violence is okay. Uh, so expect more of that. And then six, doubling down on Republican vote suppression tactics. Uh, the, the pandemic allowed Democrats to organize in particular ways that they hadn't uh, in some respects since the civil rights era. But uh, through redistricting, through the census and gerrymandering, and then through changing voting rules, uh, Republicans are going to crack down in every state or try to. And so ex don't expect that uh, the courts are necessarily going to be on the Democrat side either as this plays out. Seven, and I'll just finish up here with these two. You have a Democratic establishment and moderates whose lesson out of the 2020 election is that they're angry with progressives because it was progressives that were pushing um, branding and, and marketing terms that were out of the mainstream, uh, where the, the, the left got stuck with terms like defund the police and therefore moderates uh, didn't do well down ticket in the presidential election. So the Democrats, as they do a forensic audit, blame progressives, which means that um, voices like Bernie Sanders, but more importantly, like uh, some of the younger generation of lawmakers that are coming along in Congress, like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Orlean Omar, or Rashida Tlaib, or Ayanna Presley, are going to be sidelined. And, and it, that has already started, but it will continue as long as Democrats think they can pass things with 50 senators and a bare majority in the House. So while they may speak, and many of us like it that they have a voice, uh, their committee assignments are probably not going to be uh, championed. They're not going to move up the ladder in Democratic politics and they're gonna be continually sidelined. One of my research interests is looking at the Democratic wing of the Democratic Party and progressivism over time. And this is not something new to Democrats. 
this will continue. Uh, so don't expect that AOC is going to be the front runner for the 2024 presidential nomination if Joe Biden retires or decides to do one term. It probably isn't going to happen because there's voices in the party that are going to try to prevent that. And finally, as much of many us, of us here don't necessarily like where the GOP or the Democrats are, um, I have listened to, or tried to listen to the other side in, in listening to a lot of podcasts, particularly the, the never Trumper side of the Republican Party. Um, and there is a need for a moderating and middle of the road voice in all of this, because there aren't too many people who are moderates. There are a lot of progressives and there are a lot of people on the alt-right and the far right. There's not too many people in the middle and they have tended to hold the, the, the uh, system in place and together at times of crisis. But you can count on your hands the number of moderates in both parties elected in the House and Senate. And without them and without giving voice to them, uh, there's a challenge here. And that means going into both Democratic Party and the Republican Party and primarying people who are especially in the House uh, from the center. Uh, and that's something that that maybe the the parties haven't really thought of or, or 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 have the money and funding to do, but that may have to occur in a lot of these ridings that are competitive or these districts that are competitive, in order for a center to rebuild simply to keep uh, political dialogue respectful and not violent. So I'll leave it there. I'm sorry my thoughts were not more positive, but. Uh, that's sort of my take on, on the election a couple weeks out from this insurrection. Thanks. Um, well, thanks. Uh, I want to reiterate my uh, thanks, uh, of course, for the invitation to participate in this session uh, presented by the Canada Research Chair uh, in Global Studies and also the, the Political Science Department. Um, it was interesting to hear Jamie's perspective. Avi, I'm looking forward to hear, hearing what you have to say as well. Um, on this tumultuous era in United States history. Well, as a historian, I'm averse to predicting the future, not least of which because it's impossible to do so. Uh, but I want to take this opportunity anyway to share some thoughts I have as a historian. And while it may be true that forgetting the past is an important component in forging and maintaining a nation state, American historical amnesia is truly astounding. There's something of a civic religion in American culture where former presidents ascend to a pantheon. And even those men uh, whose presidencies were hit with scandal and failure have been elevated eventually uh, to this pantheon. In recent years, we've seen the revised legacies of George W. Bush and even Richard Nixon emerge. It remains to be seen what becomes of Donald John Trump's legacy. One clear element of Trump's presidency has been trauma. Some of this has been social trauma, cutting along race and gender and class lines, Me Too, Black Lives Matter, of course. There's been the pandemic crisis, of course, the climate crisis, a host of natural disasters that seem now to be distant memories when much of the West Coast was on fire a year ago. Historically, traumatic moments in the USA have been opportunities for presidents to step in and lead. Not always successfully. Hoover did almost nothing for the first three years of the Great Depression until he realized he needed to be reelected. George W. Bush did almost nothing after Hurricane Katrina that hit New Orleans with full force. Instead of Hooverville shacks and the wandering poor of the Great Depression, or the destruction of New Orleans and moldy stockpiles of unused FEMA trailers after Bush's non-response to Hurricane Katrina, Trump's legacy is so far at least 400,000 dead of the coronavirus and an insurrection on Capitol Hill. And of course, we await the outcome for his legacy as president uh, twice impeached, but will he be convicted? With Trump, though, there is also political or institutional trauma. He has shaken the central tenet of American political fundamentalism, the sacred text of the Constitution, the so-called balance of powers in the United States. 
and especially performative, the peaceful transition of power that was supposed to be the hallmark of American democracy on Inauguration Day. Curiously, Trump doubled down, ramping up his authoritarian persona, depending on a leadership cult to push his way through his term in office. Now, looking back on this, there was serious resonance for me with at least two previous presidents. They're both Andrews, Andrew Jackson and Andrew Johnson. And I just want to unpack these presidencies a little bit, not because history is repeating itself, but because there are kind of parallels and echoes, I think, analogies, maybe. When Trump campaigned on an anti-Chicano platform with patriotic sloganeering in white working class locations, I thought first of Andrew Jackson, the seventh president of the United States during the long presidential campaign of 2016. In fact, Donald Trump hung Jackson's portrait in the Oval Office when he assumed the presidency. Andrew Jackson was a war hero. He was born in the 18th century. He served as a general in the War of 1812 and also many subsequent so-called, at least in American parlance, Indian Wars. Andrew Jackson was a slave trader, not just a slave holder. He was a general and he became a populist war hero. He ran for president in 1824 at a moment when there was only one political party in the United States, the Democratic Republican Party. The other opposition party had crumbled and fallen apart in the years following the War of 1812. Five men ran for the presidency in 1824 and Jackson was already something of a celebrity by the time he decided to run for president. But Jackson didn't win. In fact, Congress decided the outcome of the 1824 presidential election because there was no clear electoral victor. Congress gave the presidency to John Quincy Adams over Jackson. Jackson's response, he would found his own political party, the Democratic Party, the modern Democratic Party was founded by Andrew Jackson. He began campaigning almost immediately. He tried to devise this image, not just as a war hero and a celebrity, but of a common man. He campaigned as an everyman. He handed out little tin, um, I guess, bottles of log, shaped like log cabins full of moonshine. He adopted folksy slang. He published some of his, his speeches with spelling errors in them. He was supposedly a common man, but he was himself very wealthy. He sought to lower the requirements, interestingly enough, for voting. He pushed forward universal white male suffrage, expanding those who could vote. And often historians look back on this and call it the era of the common man. I'll return to that in a second. But the tone of Jackson's presidency was immediately apparent even on his inauguration. So he was elected in 1828 when he assumes office. In 1829, he holds um, a party at the White House itself. And the party's deluged with all kinds of, shall we say, eager supporters who get drunk and begin to tear the place apart. In fact, Jackson has to be quietly whisked away by bodyguards so that he doesn't suffer any of the violence that went on in the White House itself. Not quite an insurrection, but let's say not the first time a, 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 a place of office in the United States was ransacked. Most history textbooks used to overlook Jackson's run up to the presidency, the thing that made him famous. He is probably most famous for genocide against Aboriginal people in the United States. In wars against the Creek, the Seminole, the Choctaw, the Chickasaw, and the Cherokee nations. In order to celebrate Jacksonian democracy as the era of the common man, he tried first to rid the United States of those who weren't white and subject those who weren't white, African origins, to slavery. 
It was an era of the common man, yes, but an era of genocide and the growth in a more brutal form of slavery that would eventually set the United States towards sectional strife over Western land that eventually precipitated the Civil War. By the way, did you, any of you see today's announcement that uh, Joe Biden has just announced that Andrew Jackson, his, his face is on the $20 bill, will be taken off the bill, or at least new $20 bills, uh, will be printed with Harriet Tubman's likeness. This is a project that Trump put the, the brakes on when he assumed the presidency. This was one of the Obama era legacies. There's more to Jackson's legacy than just the portrait in uh, the Oval Office. On to the next Andrew, and I'll speed up a little bit here. Andrew Johnson was the first president to be impeached. You probably, if you know about Andrew Johnson, appreciate that he was Abraham Lincoln's second vice president. Lincoln founded or, or was part of a group of men that founded the modern Republican Party. After uh, Lincoln's first term, Lincoln sought a vice president looking toward the end of the Civil War, knowing it was coming. And he did something unusual. He reached across the aisle and picked a Democrat. And Andrew Johnson was a Democratic senator from Tennessee who ran on Lincoln for the ticket with an eye toward the end of the war. Lincoln was assassinated in April of 1865 during the final months of the Civil War and Andrew Johnson assumed office. Johnson, immediately upon assuming office at the conclusion of the Civil War, was impeached by Congress for a series of executive actions that would have allowed the former Confederate states to re-enter the United States under extremely lenient terms. And to make a long legal history short, Johnson was effectively removed from office as Congress took over the rebuilding of the United States. Now, Johnson may be the first president uh, to be impeached and removed from office. Nearly a century later, Richard Nixon resigned rather than face impeachment over a different set of circumstances, for sure, but in a country that was politically divided, probably similarly to the era of the Civil War and probably similarly to, John, or to Jackson's era of the common man. So what's next? What will Joe Biden do. In part, Jamie's talked a little bit about this. One of the things I've been wondering about as a historian to gain traction and support in a kind of missing political center has been wondering whether or not Biden might have such a package as a new kind of great society or new deal program that he did not campaign on whether there will be a broad sweeping series of reforms that he could point to as common purpose. But things are different now, of course. Political polarization is as deep perhaps as it has ever been except for the second American revolution of the Civil War. Things are different now because of the practice though of social mobilization too, on both the left and the right. I would say the right wing has been practiced with Trump rallies and mass demonstrations and progressives certainly know how to undertake direct action. The question is what will come next? But of course, as a historian, I don't want to go into that territory, at least not in the formal presentation, maybe in the questions. I think I'll wrap that up for now. Thanks. Well, so nice to hear from both of you. And I too thank Tracy, um, Matthew, Sean, everybody who organized this and invited me to speak here. Um, and like Brad, you stole my words. I'm also a historian and I don't like to predict the future <laughs> because I know we can't. There's so many contingencies and at any, you know, going back in history at any particular moment, you think who would have been able to predict what happened next? Nobody, because there's just too many histories just contingent on too many different things. But um, I wanna talk about some specific policy areas um, where I think um, there's been too much of a sense on the part of liberals and even progressives in the United States to say, oh, thank goodness we finally have um, a reasonable president again and we can go back to normal and we can trust uh, 
in the government. So I want to talk about why um, I think that's that's not what we should be thinking at this moment. So um, a couple of different areas that I wanted to mention. First of all, I think the two, and um, these have also been mentioned, the two greatest crises facing the United States right now are, of course, the pandemic and climate change. And I see a lot of parallels um, in how both the Trump administration and progressives and the Biden administration are, um, are conceptualizing these two issues. Um, the Trump administration, of course, was a uh, was denialist, um, non-believing in science, thinking that climate change is a hoax, coronavirus is a hoax, um, that, uh, and therefore uh, taking really um, counterproductive actions like telling people not to wear masks and approving new uh, new gas and oil drilling projects and pulling out of the Paris Agreement and pulling out of the World Health Organization. Um, and a lot of the discussion focused around science and a lot of the liberal and progressive um, reaction centered on science. Like, how can we deny science? We have to believe science. And I don't know if you guys have these in Canada, but like half the houses in my neighborhood have those like lawn signs saying, in this house, we believe in science. Like that's, that's the posturing, that's the proof that you're really a died in the world progressive if you believe in science. Um, and of course, um, Biden has fulfilled the hopes of people who believe in science by announcing over and over that he does believe in science, that um, we're putting the scientists back in charge, that we're rejoining the Paris Agreement, that we're rejoining the World Health Organization, and now we're gonna have science-based policies about that are going to help us with these great crises. Um, but I would like to say that um, while of course I do believe in science, um, science is not enough to get us out of these problems and that in some ways focusing just on the science is accepting the larger political economy that I think is what got us into these problems to begin with and that we really have to confront if we want to, um, to confront pandemics and climate change. That is, yes, there is a science behind climate change, there is a science behind pandemics, but uh, if we just narrowly look at a virus or a CO2 emission, we're not asking the bigger questions of why, what is it about our political economic system, um, our global economy that the United States uh, is the biggest promoter of, um, of overconsumption and overproduction and overuse of resources. Um, it's capitalism that is the cause of climate change and of emerging pathogens, because it's capitalism that is pushing us to continue trying to grow our economies, extract resources, produce more, consume more, throw more away, um, are pressing up against planetary boundaries, not only um, in terms of CO2 levels, but, but the whole spectrum of planetary boundaries. And that's also what's pushing us into um, the factory farming and deforestation that are what are behind the emergence, the rapid emergence of pathogens in recent decades. So I think we need to think bigger than science, not that we forget or ignore science. Science, of course, is very important. But if all we can think about is a cure and a vaccine, that's not going to help us avoid the next pandemic. Um, so... So I don't want us to be lulled into this sort of narrow, oh, we can find the answer in science and we don't have to think about political economy anymore. We do have to think about political economy if we care about um, pandemics and if we care about climate change. Um, the second thing is foreign policy. Um, and the progressives and the liberals who are so happy right now are not talking at all about policy. Um, they're looking at uh, Biden's cabinet picks and every single day, you know, you talk about the mainstream media, uh, there's all this celebration of how diverse and how diverse and how diverse and how diverse. Um, but who are all of these people who, these very diverse people who Biden is choosing, what do they really stand for and what, they're, what are they going to do? Um, uh, so just to look quickly at, at foreign policy, um, Biden is really upping the um, rhetoric against China um, in very bellicose ways. He's saying, you know, Trump liked to cozy up to dictators, but not me, I'm gonna go after China. Well, that's not really good for people who care about world peace, right? Um, 
uh, Biden is extremely committed to continuing Trump's pro-settlement, pro-right-wing policies on Israel, keeping the um, embassy in Jerusalem, um, making sure that uh, Israeli settlements are not going to be any kind of uh, block to increased US military aid to Israel, um, promoting the uh, the reconfiguring of alliances uh, that are bringing some of the most right-wing Arab countries into alliance with Israel um, to the detriment of Palestinians and Palestinian rights. So that's another area where the, um, the policies that Biden himself is promoting are going to bring us to more war and more human suffering. Um, regarding Latin America, uh, and immigration, and of course, Biden looks at his Latin America policy through the lens of immigration. He's talking about increasing aid to Latin America, but I think it's really important for us as historians to think about what does aid to Latin America actually mean? Um, a lot of the US aid that goes to Latin America goes into two areas. One is security. It goes into military aid. Um, we give them money to keep our arms industry going. Um, so that kind of aid is not going to help poor people in Latin America. Um, it's going to help repression in Latin America. The second kind of aid um, is aid that goes to help U.S. corporations in Latin America um, to promote economic development in the interest of foreign investors. Um, that also is a kind of aid that's going to help U.S. corporations. It's not going to help poor people in Latin America. So when we hear the word aid, it's kind of like oh, aid is nice, that means we're good. Um, but we need to look underneath the word and, and look at what this aid is really doing. Um, and I should also remember that it was a democratic administration, um, Obama, Hillary Clinton, and of course, Vice President Biden that oversaw the 2009 coup in Honduras, which is the was the beginning of a chain of events that have led to um, the flood of migrants out of Honduras today that uh, the United States now, and, and one thing that Biden I think is going to rest on the laurels of Trump is turning Mexico and Guatemala uh, into the US wall. So it's on the Southern border of Mexico, the Southern border of Guatemala where US trained and armed and supplied forces are stopping the migrants before they get anywhere near the United States. And um, so Biden gets to sort of take credit for saying nice things about immigration while continuing to fund a policy that's sort of out of sight um, and apparently out of mind for a lot of people. Um, three of the big progressive demands um, that the Biden-Harris administration has made it clear that they're not going to move on um, is the defund the police, um, Medicare for all, Biden's come out very clearly, both candidates, both um, Biden and Harris have come out very clearly against this and legalizing marijuana. So these are two very, uh, three very concrete and simple areas where they have come straight out and said, we are not interested in a progressive agenda at all. Um, Finally, just to look at some of the cabinet choices, I just want to mention a couple of them. I see I only have a couple of minutes left. Um, Secretary of State Antony Blinken um, is a very uh, pro-war hawk in practically every area of the world, especially in the Middle East. So I think we can expect to see, um, not that Trump was an anti-war president, but he was not the most uh, aggressive president um, in the Middle East. And I think we're in for some much uglier things happening in under a Biden administration. Um, Averill Haynes, bringing back Averill Haynes, who was one of the worst Obama administration officials in terms of the Middle East, um, censoring the CIA, the Senate uh, torture report of the CIA, um, promoting drone assassinations, uh, and finally, I guess I'll just mention um, Janet Yellen. And, you know, it's, again, uh, all we hear about is how diverse these people are, you know, first female Secretary of Treasury, but um, she basically oversaw the 2008 recovery um, in the interests of the financial industry. 
And if you look at the roster of um, Biden appointees, you see just how deeply immersed they are, all of them, in the corporate sector. Um, and in fact, just what Trump said about the swamp, many of them in a revolving door, um, especially from some pro-Democrat um, corporations like um, West Executive Advisors and Pine Island Cap uh, Capital Partners, um, financial institutions that uh, the Obama administration officials went into uh, after he left office and are now being brought back into the Biden administration. So unfortunately, a lot of what this far right conspiracy theorists um, are saying about the Democrats is true. And um, unfortunately, we're going to be seeing the results of that in the next four years. There, I predicted the future. Okay, thank you very much. Um, all of you kept well within your time limits. I really appreciate that.